Luke chapter 1 The Birth of John the Baptist The first four verses of Luke's Gospel are one sentence in the original Greek. They are written in refined, academic, classical style. But then, for the rest of the Gospel, Luke didn't use the language of scholars, but of the common man, the language of the village and the street. Through this, Luke said to us, this account has all the proper academic and scholarly credentials, but it is written for the man on the street. Luke wrote so that people would understand Jesus, not so they would admire his brain and literary skill. Verses 1 and 2 Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us. So Luke wrote his gospel knowing that many had already written histories of the life of Jesus. This may be a reference to the works of Mark and Matthew. Most people will think John was written after Luke. And it may also refer to other biographies of Jesus not directly inspired by the Holy Spirit. Some researchers will claim that the writings about Jesus did not come about until two or perhaps three generations after his death on the cross. But the work of German papyrus expert Karsten Thied in December 1994 will suggest that we actually possess copies of Matthew that date close to the very time of Jesus. Thede's findings are based on careful analysis of the handwriting script used on the recently discovered fragments. So, the previously mentioned writings contain things already commonly known and believed among Christians of Luke's day. When Luke wrote, most Christians already knew all about the life of Jesus, both from the oral accounts that were passed on by the original disciples and by the biographies that had already been written. With the word us, Luke put himself in the community of Christians who believed and received the accounts of Jesus' life. Luke was a companion of Paul in Acts 16, 2 Timothy 4, and Philemon chapter 1, verse 24. And Paul called him a beloved physician in Colossians chapter 4, verse 14. Luke was a doctor and therefore a man of science and research, and this is reflected in the history of the life of Jesus. And by every indication, Luke was a Gentile, a non-Jew. In Colossians chapter 4, uh, verses 10 11 and verse 14 will show that he wasn't Jewish because he was not included in the group who are of the circumcision. This makes Luke unique in that he is the only New Testament writer who was a Gentile. And God gave this lone Gentile writer a great privilege because he also wrote the book of Acts, which makes up the second volume of this gospel. Luke wrote more of the New Testament than any other human writer did, assuming that Paul did not author the letter to the Hebrews. And so Luke is going to tell us that the prior accounts of the life of Jesus were based on the words of eyewitnesses. And those who from the beginning were undoubtedly the apostles who were with Jesus from the very start. But those who were from the beginning would also include people such as Mary herself, whom Luke probably interviewed in his research for this history of the life of Jesus. And so Luke wrote to a first century world that was burnt out on, if it feels good, do it living. Yet it offended by the, it was offended by the crazy superstitions of most religions. The world then, as today, longs for what Christianity offers, faith that's founded on fact. Verses 3 and 4. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. So Luke was not one of those who was an eyewitness of events from the beginning of Jesus' ministry, yet he puts himself in the same line as others who wrote their accounts of Jesus' life from first-hand experience, such as Matthew and Mark, because his account was based on diligent research and a perfect understanding of events. So having already read Matthew and Mark's account, Luke wanted to give a third account with emphasis on comprehensiveness and order. Therefore, Luke is the most comprehensive gospel. He documents the story of Jesus all the way from the Annunciation of John the Baptist to Jesus' ascension. 
And so Luke is the most universal gospel. In Luke, Gentiles are often put in a favorable light. Luke's gospel is one of the most interested in the roles of women, children, and social outcasts. The gospel of Luke is the one most interested in prayer. He has seven, uh, seven different references to Jesus praying that are found in this gospel alone. Luke's gospel is the one with the most emphasis on the Holy Spirit and on joy. And Luke's gospel is the one with the most emphasis on preaching the good news or the gospel. This term is used ten times in this gospel and only once in any other gospel, as well as fifteen additional times in Acts. And so Luke addressed his gospel to a man named Theophilus, but it was also written with a wider audience in mind. So by his title, Most Excellent, we gather that Theophilus was probably a Roman government official. And it's entirely likely that the book of Luke and Acts make up Paul's defense brief for his trial before Caesar, since Acts leaves Paul waiting for that trial. So whoever Theophilus was, he had already had some instruction in the faith. Verse 5 through 7. And there was, in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. So these events happened at a definite time. This was the man known as Herod the Great, who was at the end of a long and terrible reign. Ethnically, he was not a descendant of Israel, but of Jacob's brother Esau. Therefore, he was an Edomite. And he was known for spectacular building programs, but even more so for his paranoid cruelty, which drove him to execute many, including members of his own family. And so these events happened to a definite people. Zacharias and Elizabeth were righteous and obedient, yet also stigmatized by their barrenness. They had no child. And so they were, came from priestly divisions, including the division of Abijah, was noted in First Chronicles 23 and 24. Verse 8 through 10. So it was that while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people was praying outside at the hour of incense. So only priests from a particular lineage could serve in the temple. Over the years, the number of priests multiplied. There were said to be as many as 20,000 priests in the time of Jesus. So they used the lot to determine which priest would serve when. And the lot to serve might fall to a priest only once in his life. So to a godly man like Zacharias, this was probably the biggest event of his life. A tremendous privilege. A once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Surely, he wondered, what it would be like to enter the holy place. And if God had something special to speak to him in this special event of his life. It's also easy to imagine that Zacharias asked the other priests who had already performed this service what it was like, asking them if they had any unique spiritual experience when they ministered before the Lord. The whole event was filled with enormous anticipation. So to burn incense, according to the law of Moses, incense was offered to God on the golden altar every morning and every evening. Exodus chapter 30 verses 7 and 8. By this time there was an established ritual for the practice. And there were several lots cast to determine who did what at the morning sacrifice. The first lot determined who would cleanse the altar and prepare its fire. The second lot determined who would kill the morning sacrifice and sprinkle the altar, the golden candlestick, and the altar of incense. The third lot determined who would come and offer incense. This was the most privileged duty. Those who received the first and second lots would repeat their duty at the evening sacrifice but not with the third lot. To offer the incense would be a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. So, before dawn, hundreds of worshipers gathered at the temple. The morning sacrifice began when incense, when the incense priest walked towards the temple. Through the outer courts, he struck a gong-like instrument known as the magrapha. And at this sound, the Levites assembled and got ready to lead the gathered people in songs of worship to God. 
And the other two priests chosen by Lot that morning walked up to the temple on each side of the priests chosen to offer the incense. All three entered the holy place together. One priest would set burning coals on the golden altar. The other priest arranged the incense so it was ready to go and then those two priests left the temple and the incense priest was left all alone in the holy place in front of him was the golden altar of incense and it was 18 inches square and three feet high and on that small table laid the burning coals with little wisp of smoke rising up ready for the incense behind the gold altar was a huge thick curtain and behind that curtain was the holy of holies the most holy place where no man could enter except the high priest and that only on the day of atonement and as he faced the golden altar of incense to his right would be the table of showbread and to his left would be the golden lampstand which provided the only light for the holy place so when the people outside saw the two men exit the temple, they knew that the time to offer the incense had come. And so those hundreds of people bowed or kneeled before the Lord and spread their hands out in silent prayer. And they knew that at that moment, the incense priest prayed in the holy place in the very presence of God for the entire nation. And so there followed several minutes of dead silence in all the temple precincts. As Zacharias lingered in prayer in the holy place during this, the most solemn experience of his whole life. And so the connection between the burning of incense and prayer might seem strange to some, but in the Bible, the burning of incense is a strong picture of prayer. It's in Psalm 141 verse 2 and Revelation chapter 5 verse 8. So what did Zacharias pray for? He must have thought about it carefully beforehand. He may have even taken a, out a prayer list, though it's more likely that he memorized it. And he also knew how long to pray because he had attended the morning sacrifice as a worshiper many times before. So he knew how long the incense priest stayed in that temple. So he must have prayed for both needs of the nation of Israel, which was occupied and oppressed by the hated Romans. He must have prayed for God to send the Messiah. And he probably would have thought it wrong to throw in his personal needs at such a holy moment. Verse 11 through 17. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John, and you will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink and he will also be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God he will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord so the angel simply stood on the right side of the altar of incense. Zechariah probably had his eyes tightly shut in passionate prayer. And then when he opened his eyes, he saw this angel. And the angel who appeared to Zacharias was not some romantic figure or a naked baby with wings. Uh, this angel was a glorious, fearful, and awesome creature. Like most angels in the Bible, the first thing this angel has to say to this human contact is, Do not be afraid, for good reason. And so... It's doubtful that Zacharias prayed for a son when he was at the golden altar of incense. First, it might have seemed like such a selfish need. Second, since he and Elizabeth were both well advanced in years, that we'll find in verse 7, he had probably given up on that prayer a long time ago. Sometimes we pray for something for a long, long time. We pray for the salvation of a spouse or a child. We pray for the, a calling or a ministry. We pray that God would bring that special person to us. But after years of heartfelt prayer, we give up out of discouragement. Zacharias and Elizabeth probably prayed years of passionate prayer for his son, but they gave up a long time ago and stopped believing God for so much anymore. So when we are in that place, we sometimes begin in the smallest of ways to doubt the love and care of God for us. But God always loves and his care never stops. 
So Zechariah's reaction to the angel's promise was probably thinking, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't pray for a son. We're old, you know. I gave him that prayer a long time ago, praying for the salvation of Israel. And so Zechariah didn't know that God would answer both those prayers at once to use his miracle baby to be a part of sending the Messiah. And Zechariah had no idea that God would answer the two greatest desires of his heart at once. He had probably completely given up the idea of being a dad, and it was a hope that was crushed over the years of disappointment. But God had not given up on it, even though Zechariah and Elizabeth had. So the boy was given a name before he was ever even conceived, and this was a command from the Lord to name the boy John. And this is probably a reference to the vow of a Nazarite. He'll never drink wine or strong drink. And that's found in Numbers chapter 6. Their son John would be especially consecrated to God all the days of his life, as Samson should have been. So though John would be great in the sight of the Lord, by the grace of God, he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. In Matthew 11 verse 11. So their son John would have a unique filling of the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit even while in the womb. And let us learn by this example that from the earliest infancy to the latest old age, the operation of the Spirit in men is free. And so John's great work would be to prepare the way of the Messiah by turning hearts to God before the Messiah came. The pattern for his ministry would be the great prophet Elijah and the spirit and power of Elijah. Jesus later said this was fulfilled in John in Matthew 11 verse 14 and chapter 17 verse 12 of Matthew. And so this quotation to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, that's from Malachi chapter 4 verses 5 and 6. And it's meaningful for more than just its reference to Elijah. These were essentially the last words in the Old Testament, and now God's revelation is resuming where it had left off. Elijah was a man who called Israel to a radical repentance in 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 20 through 40. Verses 18 through 20. And Zacharias said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. And was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. So Zachariah's attitude was, thanks for this promise, but knowing the condition of this wife and I, uh, can you give us a sign to prove it? It's not that he doesn't want to believe this. He does. He just simply, he feels it must be too good to be true. And he has probably protected himself from disappointment by not setting his expectations too high. So we rob ourselves of many a miracle by that same attitude. And Zacharias looked at the circumstances first and what God can do last. We are tempted to think this is logical, but if God is real, and he is, there is nothing logical about putting circumstances before God at all. So Gabriel is going to remind Zacharias of who he is and where he came from. There's a big contrast between I'm an old man and I am Gabriel. Uh, You can ask, you know, which one held more weight? Gabriel also preaches the gospel to Zacharias, which means brings you glad tidings. So it's nothing but good news to Zacharias that he would not only have a son, but that the son would have a significant role in God's plan of redemption. This is the good news that Gabriel brought to Zacharias. And this is going to give a better idea of what it really means to preach the gospel. It's to bring good news to people who need it. And if there is no Zacharias, then there is no John the Baptist. If there was no John the Baptist, there is no herald announcing the coming of the Messiah. If there was no herald announcing the coming of the Messiah, then the prophecies of the Old Testament regarding the Messiah are unfulfilled. If any of those prophecies of the Old Testament regarding the first coming of the Messiah are unfulfilled, then Jesus did not fulfill all things. If Jesus did not fulfill all things, then he did not complete God's plan of redemption for you and I, and we must perish in our sins. So, that being said, this was very good news, right? (laughs) So, Zacharias paid the price for his unbelief. His unbelief did not make God take his promise back, but it did keep Zacharias from enjoying it, right? You're going to be mute and not able to speak. And so, when we do not believe God's promise for our lives, we do not necessarily destroy the promise, but we do destroy our ability to enjoy that promise. What made this such a severe punishment was that Zacharias had such great news to tell and wouldn't be able to. Strangely, many Christians would not consider this a punishment. They don't mind keeping quiet about the good news of Jesus. 
right? We should be excited to spread that news. So verse 21 through 23, And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he lingered so long in the temple. But when he came out, he could not speak to them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned to them and remained speechless. And so it was, as soon as the days of his service were completed, that he departed to his own house. So the custom was for the priest to come from the temple as soon as he was finished praying, to assert and to assure the people that he had not been struck dead by God. So Zechariah's delay had started to make the crowd a little nervous. So after the incense priest finished, he came out of the holy place through the great doors of the temple and met the other two priests right outside the doors. Then the incense priest raised his hands and blessed the people with a blessing from Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 through 26. The hundreds of gathered worshippers knew what to do. They responded by saying, Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. So after all this, the Levites got to worship singers, um, and the, they got these you know, singers and musicians started for worship. And they began with a blast from special silver trumpets. Then a priest struck the cymbals, and the choir of Levites began to sing the psalm of the day. And the choir was made up of not less than 12 voices, which mingled young and old for a full range of sound and probably some great harmonies. So when Zacharias came out, he was supposed to stand on the temple steps overlooking the crowd and pronounce the priestly blessing on the people. Numbers 6, verse 24 through 26. And the other priests would repeat it after him, but Zacharias here could not speak. He was mute. So doing the best that he could through hand motions, he told the story of what happened to him in the temple. It looked probably a lot like charades, and it's hard to know if everyone believed him or not. And uh, verse 24 and 25. So now after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and she hid herself five months, saying, Thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me to take away my approach among people. So Zacharias had normal relations with his wife. He partnered with God to fulfill the promise. He did not count on this child coming from a miraculous conception. And so Elizabeth did not go away to hide her pregnancy. She was gone for the first five months, the time when she would have be least noticed as pregnant. She went away to spend time with the Lord and to meditate on the destiny of the child within her. Verse 26 and 27. Now the six months... The angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. So Gabriel's work was not finished with the announcement to Zacharias in the temple. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, he came to a village in Galilee. So chronologically, this is the first mention of Nazareth in the Old or New Testaments. Nazareth is perhaps remarkable for its unremarkable nature. It was unmentioned in the Old Testament, in the Apocrypha, and in the writings of Josephus. So though Nazareth is in the general region of Galilee, it is 15 miles away from the Sea of Galilee. It is 6 miles from the closest major road. Nazareth had no good water supply, only one fairly weak well in the center of the village. And Jesus would forever be identified with this place, being repeatedly called Jesus of Nazareth in Mark chapter 1, John chapter 18, John chapter 19, and Acts chapter 2. His followers were also called Nazarenes in Acts 24 verse 5. And so Mary was betrothed to Joseph, and there were three stages to a Jewish wedding in that day. There was engagement, a formal agreement made by the fathers. There was betrothal, the ceremony where mutual promises were made. And marriage, approximately one year later, when the bridegroom came for his bride at the unexpected time. So when a couple was betrothed, they were under the obligations of faithfulness, and divorce was required to break the betrothal. This was not a casual promise. So Mary is clearly said to be a virgin. There is no ambiguity about the idea here. Mary never had sexual relations with any man. The conception of John the Baptist, the forerunner, was miraculous. We should expect an even more remarkable conception of the Messiah. The name Mary is the Greek form of the Hebrew name Miriam, the sister of Moses. It means exalted one, a fitting description of the soon-to-be mother of the Messiah. Verse 28 and 29. 
And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. So Gabriel said three things to Mary. Each of these was certainly true of Mary, who had a unique privilege among any person to ever live. She was highly favored, that the Lord was with her, and she was blessed. However, all these things are true of the believer in Jesus. We are highly favored as Mary was in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 6, which will say, To the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. The Lord is also with us in Matthew 28 verse 20, where it says, Teaching them to observe all things I have commanded to you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. And we are also blessed in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So the fact that Mary was troubled at his saying will show her humility. Mary was surprised to hear such extravagant words said about her. Verse 30 through 33. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son. And shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. So the focus was not on Mary but on the son to be named Jesus, which was a common name. And the son was unmistakably identified as the Messiah predicted by the Old Testament. And he will be great. No one has influenced history more than Jesus Christ. Jesus is great in the perfection of his nature. He's great in the grandeur of his offices, in the splendor of his achievements, in the numbers of those he rescues, and he's great in the estimation of his people. And Jesus would be the son of Mary, but not only her son. He would also be and be known as the son of God. And he will be the Messiah that's prophesied to David in Second Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 through 16, who has the rightful authority to rule over Israel, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary knew exactly what Gabriel was talking about because she was a woman of the word of God. When Gabriel said this, Mary knew he quoted from Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, The virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Verse 34 through 37. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who is called barren. For with God nothing will be impossible." So Mary's question was logical. She asked the same question Zacharias asked in Luke chapter 1 verse 18. But his question was asked in skeptical unbelief. And her question was asked in wonder-filled faith. There's a difference. And Gabriel answered that the power of the highest and the person of the Holy Spirit would overshadow Mary. The word overshadow means to cover with a cloud, as in the cloud of the Shekinah glory. The Shekinah glory is in Exodus chapter 16 and 19, 24, 34, and chapter 40. Or it's the cloud of transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17, Mark chapter 9, and Luke chapter 9. So this cloud was a visible manifestation of the glory and presence of God. This means that the same power of God that was with Moses and others in the Old Testament was now going to do a unique work in the life of Mary. So technically speaking, however, the angel is predicting a virginal... um, conception rather than a virgin birth. As far as anybody can tell, the actual birth of Jesus was normal, not so his conception. So because this is going to be a manner of his conception, he would be a holy one different from all the others, and he would be called the Son of God. And this does not have the same impact on us today because of our unfamiliarity with the idea of being a son of God. But Mary and all the other Jewish people from her culture knew what this meant. This child would be equal to God in John chapter 5, verse 18. Jesus did not become the Son of God. He was called the Son of God, recognizing his nature from all eternity. <clears throat> so with such an amazing promise, Gabriel also brought evidence, explaining that Elizabeth was also pregnant. If God could do that, then he could do what he promised for Mary. And so the point's clear, more literally. Uh, one could translate this for, No word of God shall be powerless. You know, with God, nothing shall be impossible. God will absolutely perform what he had said. 
And the words for nothing, literally no word, will be impossible for God, will recall the divine promise of a son addressed to Sarah in Genesis chapter 18 verse 14 in the Septuagint. And in so doing will provide another confirming example of God's ability to carry out his promise to Mary. Verse 38. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So Mary first responded by agreeing with what Gabriel said about her. She was the maidservant of the Lord, and it was not her p position to debate with her master, but to accept what he said. And so Mary then responded with the affirmation of faith, let it be according to your word. That's the proper response of every believer to every promise of God. And all of this took a lot more trust in the Lord than we might think. Mary agreed to receive a pregnancy that would be seen as suspicious. And this is in a culture that had the potential death penalty for adultery. So Mary identified herself with sinners so that the purpose of God would be fulfilled. And so spiritually speaking, there are similarities between God's work in Mary and his work in every believer. Jesus lives within every believer spiritually, as he did in Mary physically. Jesus lives within us spiritually by his word, as he did in Mary physically. Jesus is made visible to the world through us, as he was through Mary physically. So we don't know the exact moment Jesus was conceived in the womb of Mary. It might have been when Gabriel spoke to her or soon after. Whenever it was, the cloud of God's glory overshadowed Mary. In verse 35, and Jesus was miraculously conceived in Mary's womb. Jesus' birth from this conception is what we would call the virgin birth. When we approach the event we call virgin birth, we have to agree with Paul's analysis. Great is the mystery of godliness in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. But the message of the scriptures is clear regarding the virgin birth. There can be no question about the virgin birth, only questions on the authority of scripture. And the virgin birth is unique. Many mythologies have legends about a god who had sexual relations with a woman and produced offspring, but the idea of a virgin birth is unique to Christianity. Verse 39 through 41. Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. So Mary heard from Gabriel that her relative Elizabeth was pregnant in Luke chapter 1 verse 36. So she went the considerable distance somewhere between 80 and 100 miles from the region of Galilee to the hill country of Judea for a visit. And so Mary probably understood that not many people would understand her experience with Gabriel and a miraculous conception. So if anybody could understand, it would be Elizabeth. And so when Elizabeth saw Mary, her unborn child, John the Baptist, leaped because he was filled with joy. Even though John wasn't even born yet, he had the spiritual awareness and could respond to the Spirit of God. Verse 42 through 45. Then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you young among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. So John the Baptist had not yet been born, and Zacharias was still mute. Yet Elizabeth believed the word of the Lord given to her husband Zacharias when he was in the temple. In the temple, Gabriel told him that their promised son would be make, uh, they would make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And so Elizabeth believed that and also believed that the baby in Mary's womb was the Lord who Elizabeth's son would prepare the way for. And this faith was in Elizabeth because she was filled with the Holy Spirit. And so Elizabeth recognized that Mary's faith played an active role in receiving the promise. God's promises should never make us passive. They should prompt us to seize them by faith. Elizabeth wanted to encourage Mary's faith, so she declared there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. Verse 46 through 56. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. 
and his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm and has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their stone from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers to Abraham and to his seed forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her house. So this song, often called the uh, Magnificat, after the Latin translation of the first few words, resembles Hannah's song in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 1-10. through 10. But it also has at least 12 other allusions to the Old Testament. And it means that Mary was a woman who studied and knew God's word, the Old Testament at the time, the Septuagint. Uh, the scriptures were on her heart, and it came out through her song. And so Mary was great gifted and highly privileged. She did exactly what greatly blessed people should do. Mary magnified the Lord. And this remedies pride and self-congratulation and is something every blessed believer should do. And so she, her spirit rejoiced in God her Savior means that Mary needed a Savior. And she knew what she needed. Uh, she knew that she needed a Savior. And the song mainly celebrates God's goodness, faithfulness, and power. Mary's song shows the futility of trusting in yourself, or trusting in political power, or trusting in riches. Mary's trust was in God, and it was well rewarded. Verse 57 through 66. Now Elizabeth's full name, full time, came for her to be delivered, and she brought forth a son. When her neighbors and relatives heard how the Lord had shown great mercy to her, they rejoiced with her. So it was on the eighth day that they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him by the name of his father, Zacharias. His mother answered and said, No, he shall be called John. But they said to her, There is no one among your relatives who is called by this name. So they made signs to his father what he would have him called and he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, saying, His name is John. So they all marveled. Immediately his mouth was open and his tongue loosed, and he spoke, praising God. Then fear came on all who dwelt around them. And all these sayings were discussed throughout all the hill country of Judea. And all those who heard them kept them in their hearts, saying, What kind of child will this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. So the promise was fulfilled just as God said it would. God always keeps his promises. And this also fulfilled Gabriel's promise recorded in uh, verse 14. Many will rejoice at his birth. <clears throat> and so both Zacharias and Elizabeth knew that the name of the child had to be John, according to the command from the angel in verse 13. And they treated Zacharias as if he were deaf, not mute. And this must have been constantly annoying to Zacharias. They made signs to his father. <laughs> So now Zacharias responded in total faith. It wasn't, you know, I think his name should be John. For Zacharias, it was a recognition of a fact, not a suggestion. So even though he had failed before, God gave Zacharias a second chance at faith. He gives the same to us today. And so just as Gabriel said, Zacharias could speak again. He spoke praising God. And it's fitting that Zacharias' first words were praise to God. His chastisement for disobedience had not made him bitter. Instead, it made him want to trust God all the more at every opportunity. Verse 67 through 80. Now his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, who have been since the world began that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life, and you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest. For you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, with which the day spring from on high has visited us, to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. So the child grew and became strong in spirit, 
and was in the deserts till the day of his manifestation to Israel. So the prophetic voice of the Lord had been silent for 400 years. Now God spoke through Gabriel in verse 13 and 28, through Elizabeth in verse 41 and 42, through Mary in verse 46 through 55, and now through Zacharias. When God spoke again, it was all connected to the theme of Jesus and his work. So Zacharias could truly say, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he's visited and redeemed his people. It was as if God was present for Israel in a way not experienced for a long time. And so we know this was truly spirit-inspired prophecy because the first focus of his prophecy is the unborn Jesus, not Zechariah's new son, John. Jesus is the horn of salvation for us, in verse 69. Jesus is the one who saves us from our enemies, in verse 71. Jesus is the one who to perform the mercy promised to our fathers, in verse 72. Jesus is the one to remember the covenant, in verse 72. And Jesus makes us able to serve him without fear, in verse 74. So it's a song of salvation, and it has within it truth deeper than most highly the singer then understood. So Zacharias didn't even know Jesus yet, but he praised him, he loved him, and he was passionate about Jesus. We know so much more about Jesus than Zacharias did. So what can excuse the coldness of our hearts? And so after the initial focus on Jesus, the Holy Spirit then led Zacharias to speak of his newborn son and his place in God's great plan. John was a true prophet, the prophet of the highest in verse 76. He had a unique calling to go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways in verse 76. He would teach and give knowledge of salvation to God's people in verse 77. He would show people the remission of their sins in verse 77. He would give light to those who sit in darkness in verse 79. And John would guide God's people into the way of peace in verse 79. And so this child grew and became strong in spirit. The promise of God came to fruition in John's life. John was in the desert till the day of his manifestation because that is where God trains many of his prophets.